This is the first video in a three-part series on the most effective way to download, backup, and edit your images after a photo shoot. This series will help you sort your best images quickly, give you an easy editing routine to follow, and give you reassurance that your images are backed up and easy to find. There's no one right way to do things, but this system has served me well over many years with some tweaks and improvements along the way. I'm currently running a Lightroom library that has over 500,000 images going back 22 years. So developing a system that ensures I can easily and quickly find things was really important to me. Developing a routine that works for you will save you time and headaches in the long run. So here are four important points to consider when you're setting up or modifying your own system. So number one, it should be scalable. You should be able to add hard drive capacity as your needs grow and be able to copy your entire library over to another system without difficulty. And this includes changing software. For example, if I found a better software than Lightroom, I should be able to migrate all of my images over with all of their associated keywords and metadata without much fuss. And by the way, I haven't found a software yet that can compete with Lightroom's combination of digital asset management and image processing power, but I'd love to hear your suggestions if you know of comparable software. Over the years, I've migrated my backup files from tape to CDs to DVDs to hard drives, and my current system is a, a NAS, Network Attached Storage, hard drive system. And this was a uh, quite expensive, a reasonably recent addition, but should last me many, many years. You may find that a large capacity external hard drive is ample for your needs, and, and this will be much cheaper. Number two, you should have backups. Hard drives fail, computers get stolen, houses burn down. Best practice is three copies of your original captures, two on separate hard drives and one off-site, which could be in the cloud. So talking of cloud computing, I've found Backblaze to be an excellent cloud backup service. I can vouch for the fact that it does work and their helpline is very responsive. I've recovered gigabytes of data through Backblaze after hard drive failures. There's a link in the description if you're interested. I should mention Backblaze can back up external hard drives that are attached to your computer, but it doesn't automatically recognize NAS drive systems which require a bit of a workaround and I'm still setting up that on my own system as I want my cloud backup to happen automatically in the background. Now, this video is not sponsored by Backblaze, but I do get a small discount off my annual fee if, if you use the link in the description. So number three, automate on import. So automate on import as much as possible, apart from saving you time, it keeps your system consistent and you won't forget important steps. Number four, it's best to distinguish between raw files and derivative files. So raw files are your camera captures, and this could include JPEG images if you didn't shoot in raw format. Derivative files are any files such as JPEGs, TIFFs, layered Photoshop files that are generated or exported from your raw camera captures. So your derivative files can always be generated again from the raw files so they're not quite as important when it comes to backing up. But if you lose your original camera captures, you can't regain what you shot originally. Any files that I generate for social media, for websites, or for clients, I delete them from my hard drive once they've been sent. Otherwise, they'll just clutter up my hard drive with duplicate files. The exception is layered files, which are usually in PSD or TIFF format, and I may have combined images or applied other effects as layers. I consider these my working files that I may want to modify, or they could take a lot of work to put back together again. So I keep these. I'm now going to talk you through the ingest process. So that is importing your images from a memory card and backing them up. To demonstrate my system, I'll take you through the whole ingest process. I follow this process as soon as possible after a photo shoot because your captures are at their most vulnerable when they're left on the camera card. They exist only in one place. The card could get corrupted or your camera could go missing. There is also the risk of accidental deletion if you forget to download images and reformat your card. 
In fact, I don't consider a shoot finished until I have imported and backed up my raw captures. And by the way, if I have video files, I don't import them into Lightroom. Although Lightroom can handle video, it's pretty basic, so I've decided to keep my video storage and backup separate from my still images. But it has the same folder structure of year and month that I will explain later in this video. So here's my default import setup. I use an attached hard drive to store my files instead of the internal computer drive for a couple of reasons. Number one, I don't want to keep filling up my internal hard drive with images. And number two, if my computer has a meltdown, I still have my files on an external hard drive which can be plugged into another computer so I can continue, continue working. I've inserted my memory card and have Lightroom open. I use Lightroom for ingesting images because I can automate tasks such as backing up, file renaming, applying global metadata and so on. So by the time my images have been imported from the memory card, they are renamed, backed up where they should be on my hard drive and I'm ready to start the editing process. It's all about saving time, being tidy and having a backup. So in the library module, I click on the import button to bring up the import screen. I locate my memory card in the source column on the left and the images to import appear in the middle panel. I can see that the images to import are already ticked. I can untick images I don't want to import, but in this case, I'm importing everything, so I'll leave that as it is. At the bottom of the import screen, I have my import presets, and this is where I'm going to start. You can see I've already made quite a few presets for different import scenarios, so for now I'm going to choose raw from card. Next, I check the destination location is correct. You can find this at the top right of the import screen. By clicking on it, you can change the destination folder if you need to. I can see mine is set to the correct place, which is my fast solid state drive, working drive, attached to my laptop. So when this SSD drive is getting full or I'm no longer working on the imported images, I transfer the files to my main storage system in my home office, which is the NAS uh, storage device. And this has a huge capacity and it's also very fast. And this allows me to be plugged into all of my files at home and have plenty of mobile capacity for when I'm on location or traveling. If we have a look at my NAS drive raw folder, you can see it has the same structure as the raw folder on my attached SSD drive. But I have many more years, I have many more year folders and month folders which are directly accessed from my Lightroom catalog when I'm plugged in to my NAS drive in my home office. If we have a look at this raw folder, you can see it is structured by year and within each year folder are numbered folders from 1 to 12 which correspond to months. And this is how I like to organize my raw images and Lightroom creates the year and month folders automatically as they're required. If I go to my folders tab in the Lightroom library module, I can see my hard drives are represented there. If I want to move folders off my portable SSD to the NAS drive system, I can simply drag and drop the folders within Lightroom. I'll get a warning that my files will be moved. If I click OK, the files are moved in the background and my Lightroom catalog has updated with the new file location. Back to my import dialog. Let's have a look at the file handling settings. I leave preview set to standard. Previews are simply what Lightroom stores to represent changes you make to the image as the original files are never overwritten in keeping with Lightroom's non-destructive workflow. The larger one-to-one -one option is for when you view the image as one-to-one -one in Lightroom, meaning one pixel of your image equals one pixel of your screen resolution. This one-to-one -one option takes up more space on your hard drive, so I prefer to leave these one-to-one -one previews to automatically generate when I need them, which is when I zoom into a particular image while I'm editing. I leave Build Smart Previews unchecked, as this is really for photographers who travel but want access to a much smaller version of RAW files that they're leaving at home. This means they can continue editing while they're on the road. And maybe that's a topic for another video. Don't import suspected duplicates. This should nearly always be left on, as you don't want to accidentally double up on importing images. 
make a second copy to. I leave this checked and this is where I can set up my backup location. Add to collection is unchecked in this case, but I do use this when I'm adding to a pre-existing or a new collection in my Lightroom catalog. On to file renaming. I always have this checked for importing images from a memory card. I have a number of templates saved, but the one I normally use is Dugan file name. If I go to the bottom of the template drop down and to edit, you can see the incredible amount of control you have over renaming your files. So let's have a look at the rationale behind my file renaming structure. I start with my last name so that when my files are sent to clients, my name is always on the file. Next I have the date format in year, month, day format. This just means that the files will line up chronologically in whatever folder they end up in. Lastly, I have the file name number suffix. This is the sequ sequential number that nearly every camera assigns to images as they are captured and ensures that each image has a unique name. I don't believe in naming my files with subject, location or client names because sometimes I want all of this information within the file and that would be just too much to put in a, a file string. And this information is also best done with embedded metadata. So with keywords you can have any number of subjects or clients attached to the image. There are also special places to store location data and these can be entered in the import preset to happen automatically. Which brings me to the apply during import tab. The most important part here is the metadata drop down menu which is where I can save my presets. Let's have a look at the one I'm currently using, J Dugan CHCH, which is short for Christchurch, my hometown, which is for when I'm photographing in my hometown. And you can see all of the information here that I can choose to have added automatically on import. In my case, I want all of my contact and copyright details and also the location da data applied automatically to my images as they're imported. You can see I have another preset saved for when I recently travelled to Italy, which has correct, correct location data applied for that location. If I change any of these settings, I can easily update the current preset or create a new preset if I need to. So next, the keyword panel. If there are any keywords that apply to all of the imported images, I can enter them here. The last panel to look at is the destination panel. This is where all of the sorting into year and month folders can be set up to ha happen automatically. I have the year month option selected. Next I just need to select the parent folder location the images will be copied to. In my case it is the raw folder that I've set up on my portable SSD drive attached to my laptop for this purpose. And if we scroll down we can see the images will be put into the 2024 folder and a new folder 10 will be created as, as there wasn't already one there in the first place. The very last thing I always do is scroll down to the import preset drop down and select update preset raw from card if I've made any changes that I want to update the preset with. That, then they'll apply to all future imports. If you don't do this step, next time you do an import it will just default back to the previous settings that were saved with the preset. Then I hit the import button and go and have a cup of coffee or do something else for a while. Once the import is completed, I'm ready to start editing knowing that my files have been renamed, backed up and have global metadata applied to them that will travel with the files as they move through my system and when they're exported. I can't stress enough how important it is to have a system that keeps your files safe, that makes them easy to find and that can be automated to save your time. So I've spent years researching digital asset management as it applies to photographers and I'm a big fan of the processes I learned from Peter Crow who wrote the damn book, Digital Asset Management. And I've modified his system to suit me but uh, the principles are much the same. And also you can modify or take what is useful to you from my system. It's different for everybody. The part two of this series will be on sorting your images into the selects that you want to work on. And then part three will be on processing your selects to be the best images that they can be. 
So that's all for this video. Thanks for watching. Hope to see you in the next one.